Chapter 1 of The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen. Chapter 1 Deeds, Character, and Destiny. There is, and always has been, a widespread belief in fate, or destiny, that is, in an eternal and inscrutable power which apportions definite ends to both individuals and nations. This belief has arisen from long observation of the facts of life. Men are conscious that there are certain occurrences which they cannot control, and are powerless to avert. Birth and death, for instance, are inevitable, and many of the incidents of life appear equally inevitable. Men strain every nerve for the attainment of certain ends, and gradually they become conscious of a power which seems to be not of themselves, which frustrates their puny efforts, and laughs, as it were, at their fruitless striving and struggle. As men advance in life, they learn to submit, more or less, to this overruling power which they do not understand, perceiving only its effects in themselves and the world around them, and they call it by various names, such as God, Providence, Fate, Destiny, etc. Men of contemplation, such as poets and philosophers, step aside, as it were, to watch the movements of this mysterious power as it seems to elevate its favorites on the one hand and strike down its victims on the other, without reference to merit or demerit. The greatest poets, especially the dramatic poets, represent this power in their works, as they have observed it in nature. The Greek and Roman dramatists usually depict their heroes as having foreknowledge of their fate and taking means to escape it, but by so doing, they blindly involve themselves in a series of consequences which bring about the doom they are trying to avert. Shakespeare's characters, on the other hand, are represented, as in nature, with no foreknowledge, except in the form of presentiment, of their particular destiny. Thus, according to the poets, whether the man knows his fate or not, he cannot avert it and every conscious or unconscious act of his is a step towards it. Omar Khayyam's moving finger is a vivid expression of this idea of fate. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Thus men in all nations and times have experienced in their lives the action of this invincible power or law, and in our nation today this experience has been crystallized in the terse proverb, man proposes, God disposes. But contradictory as it may appear, there is an equally widespread belief in man's responsibility as a free agent. All moral teaching is an affirmation of man's freedom to choose his course and mold his destiny, and man's patient and untiring efforts in achieving his ends are declarations of consciousness of freedom and power. This dual experience of fate on the one hand and freedom on the other has given rise to the interminable controversy between the believers in fatalism and the upholders of free will, a controversy which was recently revived under the term determinism versus free will. Between apparently conflicting extremes, there is always a middle way of balance, justice, or compensation, which while it includes both extremes, cannot be said to be either one or the other, and brings both into harmony, and this middle way is the point of contact between two extremes. Truth cannot be a partisan but by its nature is the reconciler of extremes, and so in the matter which we are considering, there is a golden mean which brings fate and free will 
into close relationship, wherein, indeed, it is seen that these two indisputable facts in human life, for such they are, are but two aspects of one central law, one unifying and all-embracing principle, namely, the law of causation in its moral aspect. Moral causation necessitates both fate and free will, both individual responsibility and individual predestination, for the law of causes must also be the law of effects, and cause and effect must always be equal, the train of causation, both in matter and mind, must be eternally balanced, therefore eternally just, eternally perfect. Thus every effect may be said to be a thing preordained, but the predetermining power is a cause, and not the fiat of an arbitrary will. Man finds himself involved in the train of causation. His life is made up of causes and effects. It is both a sowing and a reaping. Each act of his is a cause, which must be balanced by its effects. He chooses the cause, this is free will. He cannot choose, alter, or avert the effect, this is fate. Thus free will stands for the power to initiate causes, and destiny is involvement in effects. It is therefore true that man is predestined to certain ends, but he himself has, though he knows it not, issued the mandate, that good or evil thing from which there is no escape, he has, by his own deeds, brought about. It may here be urged that man is not responsible for his deeds, that these are the effects of his character, and that he is not responsible for the character, good or bad, which was given him at his birth. If character was given him at birth, this would be true, and there would then be no moral law and no need for moral teaching. But characters are not given ready-made, they are evolved. They are indeed effects, the products of the moral law itself, that is, the products of deeds. Character result of an accumulation of deeds which have piled up, so to speak, by the individual during his life. Man is the doer of his own deeds, as such he is the maker of his own character. And as the doer of his deeds, and the maker of his character, he is the molder and shaper of his destiny. He has the power to modify and alter his deeds, and every time he acts, he modifies his character, and with the modification of his character for good or evil, he is predetermining for himself new destinies, destinies disastrous or beneficent, in accordance with the nature of his deeds. Character is destiny itself, as a fixed combination of deeds. It bears within itself the results of those deeds. These results lie hidden as moral seeds in the dark recesses of the character, awaiting their season of germination, growth, and fruitage. Those things which befall a man are the reflections of himself, that destiny which pursued him, which he was powerless to escape by effort or avert by prayer, was the relentless ghoul of his own wrong deeds, demanding and enforcing restitution. Those blessings and curses which come to him unbidden are the reverberating echoes of the sounds which he himself sent forth. It is this knowledge of the perfect law working through and above all things, of the perfect justice operating in and adjusting all human affairs, that enables the good man to love his enemies, and to rise above all hatred, resentment, and complaining, for he knows that only his own can come to him, and that, though he be surrounded by persecutors, his enemies are but the blind instruments of a faultless retribution, and so he blames them not, but calmly receives his accounts, and patiently pays his moral debts. But this is not all. He does not merely pay his debts. He takes care not to contract any further debts. He watches himself and makes his deeds faultless. While paying off evil accounts, he is laying up good accounts. By putting an end to his own sin, 
he is bringing evil and suffering to an end. And now let us consider how the law operates in particular instances in the outworking of destiny through deeds and character. First, we will look at this present life, for the present is a synthesis of the entire past. The net result of all that a man has ever thought and done is contained within him. It is noticeable that sometimes the good man fails and the unscrupulous man prospers, a fact which seems to put all moral maxims as to the good results of righteousness out of account. And because of this, many people deny the operation of any just law in human life and even declare that it is chiefly the unjust that prosper. Nevertheless, the moral law exists and is not altered or subverted by shallow conclusions. It should be remembered that man is a changing, evolving being. The good man was not always good. The bad man was not always bad. Even in this life, there was a time, in a large number of instances, when the man who is now just was unjust, when he who is now kind was cruel, when he who is now pure was impure. Conversely, there was a time in this life, in a number of instances, when he who is now unjust was just, when he who is now cruel was kind, when he who is now impure was pure. Thus the good man who is overtaken with calamity today is reaping the result of his former evil sowing. Later he will reap the happy result of his present good sowing, while the bad man is now reaping the result of his former good sowing. Later he will reap the result of his present sowing of bad. Characteristics are fixed habits of mind, the results of deeds. An act repeated a large number of times becomes unconscious or automatic. That is, it seems to repeat itself without any effort on the part of the doer, so that it seems to him almost impossible not to do it, and then it has become a mental characteristic. Here is a poor man out of work. He is honest and is not a shirker. He wants work and cannot get it. He tries hard and continues to fail. Where is the justice in his lot? There was a time in this man's condition when he had plenty of work. He felt burdened with it. He shirked it and longed for ease. He thought how delightful it would be to have nothing to do. He did not appreciate the blessedness of his lot. His desire for ease is now gratified, but the fruit for which he longed, and which he thought would taste so sweet, has turned to ashes in his mouth. The condition which he aimed for, namely, to have nothing to do, he has reached, and there he is compelled to remain till his lesson is thoroughly learned. And he is surely learning that habitual ease is degrading that to have nothing to do is a condition of wretchedness, and that work is a noble and blessed thing. His former desires and deeds have brought him where he is, and now his present desire for work, his ceaseless searching and asking for it, will just as surely bring about its own beneficent result. No longer desiring idleness, his present condition will, as an effect, the cause of which is no longer propagated soon pass away, and he will obtain employment. And if his whole mind is now set on work, and he desires it above all else, then when it comes, he will be overwhelmed with it. It will flow into him from all sides, and he will prosper in his industry. Then, if he does not understand the law of cause and effect in human life, he will wonder why work comes to him apparently unsought while others who seek it strenuously fail to obtain it. Nothing comes unbidden. Where the shadow is, there also is the substance. That which comes to the individual is the product of his own deeds. As cheerful industry leads to greater industry and increasing prosperity, and labor shirked or undertaken discontentedly leads to a lesser degree of labor and decreasing prosperity, so with all the very conditions of life as we see them, they are the destinies wrought by the thoughts and deeds of each particular individual. So also with the vast variety of characters, 
they are the ripening and ripened fruit of the sowing of deeds. As the individual reaps what he sows, so the nation, being a community of individuals, reaps also what it sows. Nations become great when their leaders are just men. They fall and fade when their just men pass away. Those who are in power set an example, good or bad, for the entire nation. Great will be the peace and prosperity of a nation when there shall arise within it a line of statesmen who, having first established themselves in a lofty integrity of character, shall direct the energies of the nation toward the culture of virtue and development of character, knowing that only through personal industry, integrity, and nobility can national prosperity proceed. Still, above all, is the great law, calmly and with infallible justice, meeting out to morals their fleeting destinies, tears stained or smiling, the fabric of their hands. Life is a great school for the development of character, and all, through strife and struggle, vice and virtue, success and failure, are slowly but surely learning the lessons of wisdom. End of chapter 1 Recording by Andrea Fiore